Hey folks, welcome back to the channel and part two in this all-encompassing tour through EQ. Let's get straight in. Okay, so in the previous video, we went through all of the real sort of basic building blocks of EQ. And I took you through how to understand the frequency spectrum and fundamentals and overtones and different adjective characteristics of different frequency bands and all that good stuff. So we're picking up from exactly that point and continuing. In this video, we're going to first of all start by looking at the different sorts of equalizers we might come across. And we're going to start to identify what they're good for, what they're not so good for. We'll look at some digital equalizers. We'll look at some analog equalizers. We'll look at the different controls that you might find on them. And we'll start to appreciate why you might need different equalizers or why you might not need different equalizers. The first sort of equalizer that you're going to come across is called a parametric EQ. I'm going to pull up Logic's stock equalizer here. This is a parametric EQ. Parametric equalizers give you the ability to dial in very specific frequencies. So, for example, if I just turn this on here, I could grab any band and I can set this band to any frequency point that I wish, whether it's 100 hertz down here or 500 hertz or 4K. I can place a frequency band anywhere on any frequency and dial in a boost or a cut at any specific frequency point. That is the basic job of a parametric EQ. It allows you to be very, very specific. Why is that useful? Well, because it allows us to be quite surgical. What that means is that if you hear specific um, frequency areas within a sound that you dislike, you're able to identify them with a parametric equalizer and get rid of them. So parametric equalizers are really, really good for finding frequencies that you find unpleasant and removing them. If we think back to our previous video where I talked about how sometimes you might find overtones within a sound that might not necessarily work within the context of your whole song, a parametric equalizer is the perfect tool for finding those overtones and reducing or eliminating them. The next sort of equalizer you'll come across is called a shelving EQ. Shelving EQs I'm going to talk about in more detail in just a little bit because they're part of the anatomy of most equalizers. Um, but effectively, if you ever see this little symbol here or here, these are high shelves and low shelves, and they allow you to create a shelf in your frequency spectrum, either a boost or a cut as a low shelf or as a high shelf. Very, very straightforward. The next sort of equalizer that you'll come across is what's called a graphic equalizer. Now here is Logic Pro's stock graphic equalizer. Graphic equalizers are different to parametric equalizers because they have fixed frequency bands. So if we look at this equalizer here, you'll see that I've got a band that's fixed at 31 hertz and then another one at 63 and another one at 125. And if I look at any variation of graphic EQ, here's another graphic EQ here, you'll see that again, I've got fixed bands at those same points. Here's another version. Here's the graphic EQ. I've got fixed frequency bands at those points. So what are these good for then? If we can't be surgical with these things, what are they useful for? The answer is for shaping the character or color of something. Let's say you wanted to find a specific characteristic of a sound and boost it. You know from the guide that I presented you with yesterday that each different octave can be associated with different characteristics of sounds. And by knowing what the sort of characteristic is that you're trying to address, whether that be a boost or a cut, with a graphic EQ, it's very easy to go, oh, okay, I'm working in the fourth octave and I want a bit more of that or a bit less of that. Let me quantify that with some actual words. So let's say someone says, oh, I find that um, bass guitar really boomy. Okay, boomy. 40 to 80 hertz. Let's find the band that is closest to that. I'm somewhere in between these two. So perhaps I'm going to reduce that a bit and reduce that a bit more. Okay. Or I find that voice a little bit honky. 
a little bit nasty. Okay, 600 to 1.2. Where am I? I'm in between these two bits here. So probably I'm around about there. Oh, I find that that um, drum kit sounds really, uh, really dark. I want to brighten it up. Okay, two and a half upwards. Where am I? I'm up in this area up here. So graphic EQs are really great for shaping the overall character, the overall tone of a sound, if we're not looking to do something surgical, if we're not looking to address a specific problem or issue. Now, actually, one thing that is really cool to show you with this specific equaliser um, that you don't necessarily find in other graphic EQs is with this equaliser here, which is Logic Pro's stock vintage graphic EQ, we can actually tune it. So if I knew, for example, that my song was in the key of F major, I can find out what is the fundamental frequency of the lowest F. So I can look here and go, okay, yeah, I'm sort of 43, 44 cycles. Then I can go to my EQ here and I can tune this bottom octave to whatever is the closest to that. Okay, 44 cycles. So I know that now each one of these bands is going to be placed on the fundamental of the key of my song or on a subsequent octave of that note. So with this particular model, you can get even more kind of in tune with your song. This is an API model, API 560. On other models, we don't have that. So here's the same EQ, uh, an API 560 graphic. This is from Plugin Alliance. We don't have the ability to tune this one, likewise from Universal Audio. Um, we don't have the ability to tune that one. But on that stock Logic one, that's a really nice feature, which I just wanted to show you. The last sort of equalizer that you'll come into contact with is what's called a dynamic equalizer. A dynamic equalizer literally just means that the, um, the amount of reduction or boosting of a specific band is dependent upon the level of the input signal. So if I were to pull up this equalizer here let me just select this band i can use a dynamic cut or boost so that this frequency point will either be reduced will be attenuated or will be boosted dependent upon the input signal what that means is that i don't have to just make a, uh, a frequency change that is permanent that is always the same but i could make a change dependent upon the input signal from that channel or even the input signal from a different channel through what's called side chaining, which is a whole nother thing we'll cover another time. So dynamic EQ is the last type of EQ that you'll come across. And yeah, it's probably the most complex to understand, but still isn't a complex thing. Now, let's consider the anatomy of equalizers. What are we going to come across in an equalizer and how do we know how are we going to affect the sound? Let's just pull up Logic Stock EQ again here. Now, across the top of this equalizer, I have the most common ways to affect a sound in an equalizer. On the left and right hand side of this display, I have what are called filters. On the left hand side, I have a high pass filter. And on the right hand side, I have a low pass filter. They're named very helpfully to tell us what they do. A high pass filter means that wherever I set the frequency point, anything above that filter will be allowed to pass and anything below it will not. So anything above the point, anything higher than the point will pass and anything below will not. Conversely, with a low pass filter, anything lower than the frequency will be allowed to pass, anything above will not. So high pass filter, low pass filter. These are really great if you've got stuff like unnecessary rumble or gunk in the low end of a recording or a sound that you want to eliminate or equally you've got you know fizz and high end and airiness that you don't want you can filter those things out. The other controls that you'll have associated with filters are the slope. So if we look at the controls here I've got first of all the frequency top and bottom then I've got the slope, which will be specified probably in decibels per octave. So per octave in the frequency range, how many decibels do I want to be reduced per octave? So 
This high pass filter is set to 12 decibels per octave as a default, but we can change that to a number of different slope scales dependent upon how severe we want that slope to be. So six decibels per octave is a much, much, much more gentle slope than 48 decibels per octave, which would be, you know, a really aggressive filter. Likewise, on the low pass, exactly the same filter options. So from six decibels up to 48 decibels per octave. The bottom number here, I'm gonna come onto in just a moment because that's the same across all of our frequency types. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Let me turn off these filters. Now I pointed these out to you before, but let's talk about them in more detail. I have also got a low shelf and a high shelf on this parametric EQ. Shells allow us to do exactly that, to create either a big bump in the low end or a big cut in the low end, and conversely, either a big bump in the high end or a big cut in the high end. Why is that useful? Well, because if, for example, we wanted to reduce the bottom end of a sound entirely from 80 hertz down, I could simply grab a shelf like this, find my 80 hertz, and reduce all of the bottom end in that sound. Or conversely, okay, I want to make something uh, more airy because at the moment it's dull, or, or maybe it's too dark, I wanna brighten it up. Okay, so about 2.4K two upwards, let's find my shelf, let's stick it around 2.4K and brighten it up. So shelves are great for those sorts of moves where you're looking to address the whole bottom or top end of a sound. The other EQ type that we have in this equalizer are these bands. Sometimes they're called bands, sometimes they're called bells, sometimes they're called notches. They're all the same thing, right? It means that we can find a specific frequency point and boost or cut that very specific frequency point by however much we want. So, you know, if we were in the middle of our frequency spectrum and we thought our sound was hollow, we're around 300 to 600 hertz and we want to boost. So I'd find a band, I'd go somewhere between 300 and 600 hertz and I'd boost. Okay, very, very simple. Now, the other two numbers on all of our shells and bands here are all the same. We've got the decibel amount, which is the boost or cut, which is very simple to understand. And then the bottom number is a little bit more uh, complex to understand. It's called either, some people will call it the Q or some people will call it bandwidth. You'll see both labeled on different equalizers. It's the same thing, Q and bandwidth are the same thing. And it just means the width of the boost or cut. So if I make a nice exaggerated band here, you'll see that as I, increase the Q, the width of that specific band gets narrower and narrower, which allows me to be more and more precise, more and more surgical. And conversely, as I reduce the Q or the bandwidth, you'll see it gets wider and wider, creating a much broader Q and therefore a much um, less targeted band. If we look at that on our shelf, for example, here's our Q here. You'll see that as I increase the Q, the aggressiveness of that shelf becomes more. It becomes a, a, a more aggressive shelf. And in fact, as I go all the way up to two, I get a little bit of a boost before the cutoff frequency. Conversely, if I go to the shallowest cue I can, it becomes very, very gentle and becomes a very, very gentle shelf. Obviously, exactly the same happens with the high shelf very, very gentle as the number is smaller and much more aggressive as the number gets higher and higher. With our filters, if I just turn those back on, the Q actually gives us what's called a resonance boost. So as I increase the Q, I'm going to get a little resonance bump before the crossover frequency. So if I've got my crossover at 83 hertz here, as I increase the Q, it's going to say, I'm just going to boost the frequency just before that crossover point because if we don't have that, then what can happen is you can end up losing some of the sort of meat of the fundamental um, frequency of your sound. 
let's say for example it's a kick drum and the fundamental is at 80 hertz let's say our Q is at the stock 0 0.7 we're going to set our um, high pass filter at let's call it 60 hertz okay in order to remove stuff that's below it with a more gentle slope you'll see that if I'm on a 24 dB per octave um, slope here on this filter if my fundamental is at 80 I might actually be reducing that a little bit so even though my filter is set below the fundamental I might actually be affecting my fundamental if I introduce a little resonance bump you'll see that I'm actually putting back in a bit of focus on my fundamental frequency here at 80 hertz which allows me to ensure I'm doing the filtering that I want but also not detracting from the fundamental that I want to be targeting um, so that's how the Q or bandwidth works on filters some filters will have that option some filters will not on this parametric EQ we have it the other things that you might have on an equalizer are you might have the ability to change the analyzer to pre or post like we do here so um, post means that any changes that you've made to your equalizer will be displayed on the frequency readout that you'll see on this equalizer pre means that you're just seeing the frequency spectrum before any EQ moves that you make. So if we were to demonstrate that really crudely, I've got a pink noise generator on this track. I use a pink noise generator for this example because pink noise is a, an even representation of all of the frequencies. Doesn't sound very nice, but it allows us to get a really clear representation. So I'm gonna have this equalizer off I'll be in pre mode as well. I'm going to turn the test oscillator on and then turn the equalizer on so you can hear what it's doing. And I'll switch between pre and post here. So you'll see that as I switch between pre and post on this analyzer, it will either show me the signal before or after the equalizer processing, which can be very useful. You'll also often find um, output gain allowing you to adjust the output gain after your equalizing process, which is a very, very important thing in order to be able to gain stage through your equalizers. There are some other controls and things that you can find in this equalizer, which I'm not gonna run you through now because that's not the purpose of this. What I do want to look at though, is some other parametric EQs and try and figure out why it is that there are so many different options available to us, why are there so many different parametric EQs and how do we know which one is the right one to use? So we've seen Logic Pro's stock parametric EQ. This equalizer here that you've seen a number of times now is probably the most well-known and most famous, if you like, most well-respected parametric EQ on the market. It's FabFilters Pro Q3. It's used the world over in pretty much every professional studio and in lots of home producers setups as well. What is it about this equalizer that makes it so useful and so well respected because on the face of it it's the same right i can make bands i can boost i can cut i can adjust the bandwidth i can change the filter type to shells to filters to bands to notches you know it, it's all it's all the same stuff so what is it about this equalizer that makes it desirable well First of all, as you've seen me use a number of times already, it's got this really handy MIDI keyboard down the bottom. So if I'm trying to identify the frequency of a note, I can go, okay, the note that I'm hearing or the note that is sticking out or it's resonant is a G sharp. Okay, let's go to my keyboard. It's that G sharp there. Okay, that's the frequency that I want to attenuate. So I can identify really easily with that keyboard um, what it is that I want to do. That's a really cool feature. 
we don't have that feature in Logic's stock parametric EQ. Uh, what else is there that's going on? Well, as I've showed you very quickly before, we have dynamic EQ as well. So rather than just boosting or cutting in a permanent sense, in a fixed state, I also have dynamic boosting and cutting, allowing the, the equalizer to respond dynamically to the input signal. So I'm not permanently boosting or cutting, but I'm doing it in a, in a responsive, in a more musical way. So there's an additional thing. What else have I got in here? I've got some different functional modes. So I've got a zero latency mode, which means that I can use this um, directly monitoring input signals without worrying about it introducing any latency, which is cool. But then I've also got natural phase and linear phase modes. So it gives me different options for how precisely or how this equalizer might be working on the frequency content. That's a cool thing. I've also got different analyzer options. So I can change my analyzers from pre to post as I had done previously. I can look at also external side chains. So I can not just look at the frequency of the sound that I'm trying to affect, but I can also overlay a different channel to see how this channel is interacting with something else. That's a cool thing. I've also got in here um, match EQ functions. So I can try and match the frequency um, spectrum of one sound with another sound. That's a cool thing. I've also got in here uh, an auto match function. So I'm able to ask this plugin to automatically match the input and output signals of the equalizer. That's a cool function. You know, so there are a number of things in this plugin that make it a superior tool. But is it really, really necessary when you're learning the fundamentals of equalizing? No, absolutely not. In, in order to learn parametric equalizing, you can do it with your DAWs stock plugin for sure. Now let's compare this. Uh, this is FabFilters Pro Q3, as a reminder, with some of the other parametric equalizers on the market. Here I have Slate Digital's Infinity EQ. What's the difference? Let's have a look. Okay, I can make a band, I can boost it, I can cut it, I can change the bandwidth, I can change the different types of uh, EQ function, I can lock it, I can solo that band, as I can on, on the Pro Q. Okay, I can change between looking at individual bands or looking at an overall global curve. That's quite a cool thing. I quite like that feature. I can also enter a full screen mode, allowing me to get a really, really kind of close eye on what it is that I'm trying to do. That's quite a cool function. Okay, I like that. I've got some really, really close controls over my uh, shelf here. So I've got my sort of resonance bump here and I've got the kind of lower end of the resonance bump so I can really kind of shape that resonance um, boost at the crossover frequency. That's a kind of level of detail that I haven't had on a previous EQ. So that's slightly different. Okay, so, you know, there are some different things going on with this equalizer. That's, that's cool. What about... Uh, JST's EQ. Can I resize this? Yes, I can go full screen again. Okay, so make a band, boost, cut, change bandwidth, change the type. I've got different modes, so I can use just the left, just the right, the stereo, the middle, the sides. I can do all that on the Pro Q3 as well. Okay, I can turn on dynamic mode here and set a threshold and attack and release and sidechain so I can make each band dynamic in here as I could in the Pro Q3. Uh, okay, I've also got, in this instance, this kind of master adjustment for everything. That's kind of cool. I've got an auto gain compensation. Okay, so, you know, I've got lots of the same kind of features. Again, let's look at another one. Here I've got the Kirchhoff EQ. Looks very similar to the, to the Pro Q3. I can boost, I can cut. I've got gain, Q, slope, frequency, the ability to affect different channels, loads and loads of different filter types in here. And I know that I've got some different 
sort of analog models models in here. So, for example, the British N I know is uh, a Neve style EQ, and it's actually you know going to give me something that looks like a Neve EQ in there. So, you know, I've got some different options in the Kirchhoff. Well, I've got a look ahead in here as well. Okay, so, you know, each of these has some slight differences, but effectively for 95, 99% even of the parametric equalizing that you're going to be doing, they all do exactly the same thing. And you can probably get most of it done in your stock one. So the moral of the story is, although there are loads of tools out there on the market, loads of great tools out there on the market, and you know, all of the manufacturers are saying our parametric equalizer is the best. You you know, you need ours, you need ours. Probably you only need one of them and only when you're at the point where you're able to understand and use it well. You know, I don't need the Pro Q3 and the Infinity EQ and JST's EQ and Kirchhoff, but I have them because I use the Pro Q3 all the time. I bought it, I paid for it, I use it. I have the Infinity EQ because I pay for the Slate Digital All Access Bundle because there's a bunch of stuff that I use. I never use this EQ. The JST EQ I got for free when I bought a different JST plugin. And the Kirchhoff, I actually am a beta tester for Plugin Alliance, so I get all of their plugins um, for free to test them. So, you know, I haven't bought all four of these plugins. I bought one of them and all the rest I happen to have because they're, you know, bundled with something else. But I don't use three of them. I only use the Pro-Q3, but I could only use one of the other three as well. You know, I don't need them all. Similarly, with graphic EQs, you, you saw before that I flashed up three different types of graphic EQ. You know, these are three models of exactly the same equalizer. These are all based on the API 560 graphic equalizer, which is a, you know, a very, very famous EQ in recording studios all around the world. Now, this one from Universal Audio and this one from Plugin Alliance come as part of a whole channel strip. So we've got, you know, input gain and we've got the equalizer and we've got a compressor and we've got a gate. But if we overlook all of that, because we could, you know, bypass it all, they've all got in and out knobs and just use the EQ. We've got the same graphic EQ here and the same graphic EQ here and the same graphic EQ here. They sound more or less exactly the same. They're all modeling the same thing. You don't need all three of them. I, again, I get this one for free because I beta test for Plugin Alliance. I pay for the Universal Audio um, Spark subscription because I love their plugins. Uh, and this comes as part of it. I'll use this channel strip often on things like electric guitars because I love the API sound on electric guitars. But if I just needed the equalizer, I didn't want a whole strip. I could very easily use Logic Stock One, which would do the job just fine. So you see the message here. The message is that if you understand your different equalizer types and you understand what it is you're trying to achieve, you don't need loads and loads of tools. You just need a couple of tools and you need to know how to use those tools properly. To demonstrate that point a little bit, I want to show you some of the most famous equalizers of all time. And I wanna look at them and be able to identify what we've got on each of these equalizers. So here is a Neve 1073 EQ. The EQ section is just these four knobs here. So at the top here, I have zero decibels in the middle and you'll see that I've got this high shelf symbol. So I've got the ability to boost or cut a high shelf. There's no frequency point specified here, but the Neve 1073 high shelf is around about 12K, 12 kilohertz. So I've got a high shelf. Then I've got a band. So with the outside ring, I can move it from off to 360 to 700 to 1.6 to 3.2. 4.8 to 7.2 and I can boost or cut that band so I've got the ability to boost or cut at pre-designated frequency points then I've got a low shelf again with pre-designated frequency points that I can select between so 35 60 110 or 220 hertz boost or cut and at the bottom I've got a high pass filter with the ability to set the crossover at either off or 50, 
80, 160 or 300 hertz. So, you know, very easy to understand. I've got a shelf high and low, I've got a band and I've got a filter. Great. Let's look at a different EQ. Let's look at a Pultec EQ. Now, a Pultec EQ is uh, rather less intuitive because um, it works in a slightly different way. So it's in three parts. This is an EQP 1A. The first part is the boost attenuation and this bottom frequency. They work together. Then the next three knobs, the bandwidth, the boost, and the high fre frequency, these work together. And then I've got another two that work together at the top. So I am able to select a frequency at the bottom, my low frequency at 20, 30, 60, or 100 cycles, and both boost and cut at the same frequency point. That sounds kind of counterintuitive. What it actually ends up doing is giving us a boost and then a cut a bit above the boosted point, which gives us a kind of um, scooping effect, which is synonymous with the Pultec EQP1A, and people love it. This section here, I can then select a high frequency point, adjust the bandwidth for it, adjust the Q, and boost it. So that's just a straight boost. And then, in, and then in the top, I've got a filter at either 20, 10, or 5K that I can attenuate. That's the Pultec. Let's look at an SSL channel strip. Okay, lots of knobs to look at. I've got filters at the top. So I've got uh, a low pass filter that I can adjust. And I've got a high pass filter. I can turn those in or out. Then I've got uh, one shelf at the top. I can adjust the frequency and the boost or cut. I can also turn it into a bell. I've got another one here where I can adjust the frequency, boost or cut, and adjust the bandwidth of that bell. Exactly the same here. Frequency, boost or cut, bandwidth. And then another shelf at the bottom with frequency, boost or cut, which I can also turn into a bell. Exactly the same stuff, just presented differently. What else have I got? I've got a Marg EQ4 here. Same stuff, I've got one, two, three, four bands here. I can boost or cut at pre-designated frequency points. So the sub range is gonna be like around 20 to 30 Hertz. Then I've got a 40 Hertz band, 160 Hertz, 650. And then, and then I've got this two and a half K shelf up here, as well as an air control where I'm able to adjust the frequency of this air boost. Cool, that's all pretty self-explanatory. The last one that we're gonna look at here is the Manly, um, the Manly Massive Passive EQ, which looks kind of complicated. Um, but actually, it's very straightforward once we understand what we're looking at. I have four bands, one, two, three, four. I can set the frequency for the band at any of the pre-designated points. So 22 hertz up to 1K, 82 hertz up to 3.9, and so on and so on. I've then got a band width control. So on each band, I can either use it as a shelf or as a bell. So if it's a shelf, then I go from a regular shelf all the way up to a shelf with that resonance um, boost or cut that we talked about. And if it's a bell, then it goes from a bell with a broad bandwidth, broad Q up to a narrow Q. And then I can either boost by up to 20 dB or cut by up to 20 dB per band. That's it. I've then got filters here. So low pass filters, high pass filters, and I've got an overall gain control to trim after my equalizing. So what's the message here? The message is that whatever equalizer you're using, whether it's a Manly or whether it's a Marg or whether it's an SSL or whether it's a Pultec or whether it's a Neve, all of these different analog models will all have the same controls in them somewhere. It's all the same stuff. It's just how they affect the sound and where their specified frequency points are that will 
allow you to access the bits of the sound that you want. Likewise, with the parametric EQs that we looked at, whether it's a Pro-Q3 or an Infinity EQ or a JST or a Kirchhoff, they all more or less do exactly the same stuff. It's all the same controls. It's gain, it's Q, it's frequency, it's bandwidth. It's all the same stuff. The anatomy is the same all the time. So that's enough banging on about the anatomy of EQs for now. I'm going to leave it there. In the next video, we're going to come back and actually look at some equalizing applications and actually start to think about how do we EQ sounds? How do we identify what it is that we want to be EQing? And how do we therefore go about that? I'll see you in the next one.